We were considered freaks. Of course, we didn't consider ourselves as such. It was the rest of the universe that was crazy. I mean, who would have thought that planets with liquid water could support life? Liquid water. You might as well go swimming in liquid nitrogen while you're at it. Ugh. So there we were. Silicoid creatures in a carbon universe. The only reason anyone would talk to us was because we could manufacture their star drives at one tenth the cost. That's probably the only reason they were even the slightest bit civil, and even then you could tell that they just wanted you gone as fast as possible. So, we kept to ourselves as much as we could, as much for company as anything. Like most sapiens, we are social creatures and would have enjoyed the chance to acquaint ourselves with these strange, cold people. But it seemed that their hearts were as cold as their worlds, because no sooner than we entered the system, we were informed that unless we had something to sell, we should leave, because their habitats could not be adapted to our needs. Early on, we didn't mind. We told them that we had our own ways of compensating for the vast gulf in comfort zones, and if they would please give or sell us somewhere relatively isolated for the purpose, we would take care of the installation. Then came other excuses. Your generators are too high energy, and if we allow them on the surface and one of them malfunctioned, it would be a catastrophe. Well, we ran some simulations, and it wouldn't be any worse than one of yours blowing up. Still, it's too risky. We don't have anywhere for you. But what about that desert over? We don't have any isolated areas. And on and on. Pretty soon we got the hint and gave up trying to make friends, and settled for making money. We were used to our galactic status as useful freaks by the time the humans arrived on the stage. They were not too different, physiologically speaking, from any other species, more rambunctious than most. But this was most likely because they were still relatively new to the idea of a larger universe and had all the energetic curiosity of a child. We were sure they would calm down after a century or two, once the amazement wore off. We didn't get much in the way of gossip, but it was evident even to us after a while that these humans were unusual. Instead of growing up and taking their place on the galactic stage, they continued to explore for the sake of exploration and engage in other activities that were considered hedonistic and wasteful by the galactic community. The humans responded to this attitude with the same maturity that they comported themselves with which is to say that they extended their middle fingers, which I understand to be a gesture of extreme insult if my memory serves, and continued as they had before. Though having met a few of them, I personally think that they took a certain malicious pleasure in spitting in the eye of authority. We got here by following our desire to explore and discover, they said, and now that we're here, you want us to turn around and adopt an attitude that would have kept us planet bound until the sun blew up? No thanks or something to that effect. I've never been good at remembering speeches. It was inevitable that we would run into each other, if only because their starship's engines needed replacing and we had cornered that market long ago. In retrospect, we shouldn't have been quite so surprised that it went the way it did. They had heard of us and been warned away, but when you need an engine, you need an engine. And so I found myself in front of a video screen with a human. Like all carbon life, they looked bizarre, though at least they were vertically symmetrical. Apparently my appearance was even stranger to the human than it was to me. It leapt out of its chair and, if I was interpreting the tone correctly, cursing vehemently and invoking a deity. As per established procedure, both sides of the exchange were muted, and the translators were the only conduit for audio. But I didn't need a direct line to know that the human was lelling at his fellows, though to what end I could only guess, as the only noun it was using was untranslatable. In less than 10 minutes, there were close to 20 humans gathered around the screen, all of them using the untranslatable word in reference to me. I quickly tried looking it up in the wider interspecies dictionary, but it must have been a human-only word, because I couldn't find it in any available version, and the dictionary of the human languages was woefully incomplete. 
Eventually, they calmed, and the one originally assigned to the communication spoke. I apologize for that. Your appearance took me off guard. The human's tone was far, far more respectful than any I had ever heard. No offense taken. You were looking for a replacement part for your engine. Ah, yes. Our alpha cauterizing ring is getting corroded, and we wanted to replace it before it was too far gone. Still, that note of respect in his voice. How strange. Understood. Would you like us to install it, or would you prefer to do it yourselves? The human's mouth twitched upward on one side. You probably know more about what needs doing than we do. If you're willing to install it, that would be fantastic. The other human started murmuring. In excitement, I could only guess, but it seemed so. About how amazing it was that an untranslatable would be working on the ship. I nearly broke protocol to ask for a definition of the word they kept using, but at the last second my brain caught up to my mouth, and I finalised the schedule for the repair instead. The repair went reasonably well. Their alpha ring was indeed badly corroded and likely would have blown out after their next jump, so we replaced it and sent them on their way. I was rather puzzled by their attitude, but I put it out of my mind as an anomaly to look into later. It was only a year later that the next human ship pulled into our yard. I was on communications again and was deeply torn between established protocol and my curiosity about what they saw when they looked at me. The burly human's eyes seemed to grow to twice their size as it looked at me. Oh damn if Jose wasn't telling the truth. There's real untranslatables in the universe. Habit locked down hard and I requested the purpose of their visit. It was a simple repair, so simple that I was fairly certain that they had deliberately sought out our shipyard simply to verify whatever they had heard. Not long after that, we began to get human ships on a fairly regular basis. While we weren't very far off a popular route, stopping at one of our yards unless absolutely necessary was all but unheard of. Naturally, some of us began getting suspicious that Either the humans were up to something, or one of the other civilizations had put them up to something. What they were up to exactly depended on who was telling the tale, but every day it was a different agenda. For the most part, I ignored the half-schizophrenic ramblings of the rumour mill, preferring to research all I could about human culture and history, hoping to come across that word that they kept using to describe us, but had little luck. I became reasonably fluent in their lingua franca, though given the physiological differences of our mouths, pronouncing anything was next to impossible. It appeared that those fleshy flaps in front of their teeth play a large role in all their languages, and lacking such things, lips I believe they call them, makes intelligible conversation more difficult than it's worth. I rather wish I had found the courage to ask for a definition sooner, it would have made what happened next far more understandable. When the human ambassador arrived, the yard erupted in panic. That a species had regular contact with us was unheard of already. That one would actually send someone to talk was trending the border between a fever dream and outright impossibility. By that time, I was the one with the most experience dealing with them, so I was naturally chosen as the one to receive the ambassador. Girl. I remember rather vividly that my biggest concern was that the pressure would bring my stutter out. I was fairly certain I would die of embarrassment if that happened. The human was clad in an environmental suit, naturally, and it was bulky enough that I couldn't be sure whether the ambassador was male or female. I hoped they wouldn't be insulted if I used the wrong pronoun. We had long ago scrapped the position of ambassador ourselves. No one was willing to get within miles of one of us and their lack of cooperation meant that the most any other sapiens saw of us was a video screen conference, and that itself was rare. Most preferred text-only communication, or better to ignore our existence. So there I was, chosen as the representative of our race, or at least of our yard, which happened to be the largest of its kind. Thinking back, that's probably why the humans made contact there. They, like most peoples, but quite a bit of importance on a thing's size, assuming that something large must be important because large things require more effort to maintain or something. We regard large things as a necessary pain in the rear, 
preferring to have several moderately sized things to a few very large ones if all other things are equal. There's some saying in there, lingua franca, about eggs and baskets that refers to that kind of situation, but the exact phrase eludes me. I was vaguely familiar with their gestures, so when the suited human inclined his head to me, I knew to return the motion. Welcome to the High Sack Yard, I said. I am Kishi, and I would have the honour of accompanying you, if that is agreeable. Of course, said the human. We have much that needs to be discussed, and I would like to start as soon as possible. I hoped that I was simply interpreting a benign comment in the worst possible way, but my stomach began clenching nervously. Then please, come this way. I began to head towards the room that had been set aside for the purpose of this conference. Once the human was settled on the bench that had been adapted for its shape, I asked the purpose of his visit. To be honest, we're a little uncertain ourselves, the human said. You see, we have a planet in our solar system that's just about ideal for you, climate-wise, but we can't just give things away for free, especially something as big as a planet, and the fact that you'd be so close to our home planet makes the military types twitchy. But the rest of us think that just because everyone calls you the untranslatable equivalent to monsters of the universe doesn't mean that that's the case, and we're willing to give you a chance, especially in light of the marked lack of any kind of aggressive behaviour on your part. For long moments I stared at the human, certain that this was some kind of bizarre joke. Excuse me, but could you say that again? It sounds like you are offering us a planet. I stuttered, but I was too deep in shock to really care. A definite note of amusement entered the human's tone. In a way, it's completely inhospitable for us, but someone crunched some numbers for the hell of it, and it turns out that it's very similar to the one you came from. Those of us with a more progressive mindset figure that if we can't use it, but someone else can, we might as well see if we can hammer out some kind of agreement. I sat there, staring at them like an idiot, for what must have been several minutes. I'm here mostly to ask if you're interested in the idea as a whole, said the human, not unkindly. The official agreement will likely take weeks or months to hammer out, even if everything goes perfectly. It seemed amused by this for some reason. Something in my brain must have shorted out because the human reached out with his upper limb and waved it in front of my forward eyes. You okay there, Kishi? I twitched so hard I nearly flipped myself onto my back. I built my tongue until I calmed enough to speak intelligibly. I am fine. I paused to take several deep breaths and tried to get my thoughts into some semblance of order. I cannot speak for everyone, and I do not possess anywhere near the authority to give you any kind of official answer, but I do not think that our leadership would be at all opposed to the idea. His voice sounded both excited and pleased with my answer. I will let my superiors know, we'll send a message on the next ship, as to when and where we can meet. I nodded, another human gesture I had learned, and wished it well on this journey home. Then I stared at the too narrow bench the human had occupied during our conversation. A colony! Our first colony! We might get a real colony on a real planet instead of the roaming bands of ships strung together. Planets that we could occupy without extreme and expensive terraforming were rare beyond belief, and all of the solar systems that had them were already occupied, and thus hostile. Except now, someone was willing to let us in. I started hyperventilating and went to get myself a strong drink. Long story short, it took about seven years of negotiations, in no small part because we were suspicious as hell about the sincerity of their intentions, and the other races were making no small amount of noise about how the humans would regret associating themselves with such unnatural creatures. But in the end, we hammered out a set of compromises that benefited both of us. We would get the planet called Venus. It would be ours to do with as we wished. Terraform it, blow it up, fling it into the sun, just don't crash it into Earth, as one crankly diplomat put it. In exchange, each of us living there who was not in poverty would pay a 1% tax to the Terran government and our yards would produce or repair 500,000 tons worth of ship, which amounted to 15 medium-sized freighters, three large warships or about half the repairs their navy required. And we'll probably end up paying you for the other half, said one of the delegates. 
And they did. Venus was... It was far from a paradise, too hot even for us, and an absurdly long day and night, but once we raised the nitrogen in the atmosphere by nearly 10%, and adjusted the ratios of some of the less common gases, it cooled off enough that the weather was quite pleasant, and the atmosphere was even more dense than the one we were used to, though not so much so that breathing was difficult. In fact, because of the higher nitrogen content, breathing was actually easier, since you don't have to try very hard to get enough air. Of course, that wasn't even the best part. Since the air was so thick, we could fly. Our wings weren't large enough to support us at home, though we could glide very well. But on Venus, we could get into the air with a running start and keep ourselves there until we got too tired to keep flapping. Heard myself some pretty spectacular bruises figuring out how long that was too. Not that I regret it at all. The views were stunning. Humanity acted as something of a buffer between us and a universe that regarded our kind as freaks of nature, and we supported their love of exploring and learning for the sake of finding out interesting things. It was as close to an ideal partnership as anyone could ask for. They would develop, we would build, and we both benefited. Their asteroid belt was fantastically rich in metals and rare earth elements, which meant that we had as much raw material as we could wish for. Humanity had long ago decided on a policy of finders keepers in regards to extraterrestrial resources. As long as it wasn't in orbit around Earth's moon or have mining drones on it, it was the property of whoever got to it. There was a hiccup when we snatched an asteroid that was the destination of a batch of drones, but since humanity had forgotten to tell us, they weren't able to do much but grumble and tell us to make sure that they hadn't earmarked our next target for their operations. We grew very close metaphorically. With our help, they discovered and colonised two additional planets, and they returned the favour, helping us locate and adapt another Hell Planet, as they jokingly called our Canada's for colonisation. I was so busy with the talks, and then there was coordinating the terraforming and planning and executing the release of flora and fauna, that it was another two years before I remembered to ask about that untranslatable word that they had used early on. You can hardly imagine my surprise when I learned that it was the name of a creature from their mythology. Depending on who was telling the tale, they were either guardians or tyrants, hoarding treasure and the guardians of unfathomable knowledge, often ruling over elemental forces, and always powerful beyond measure. Dragons. I can hardly say I found the comparison unpleasant, and I guessed, correctly I might add, that this was a major factor in their early attitudes towards us. Of course, our peaceful and business-like attitudes only reinforced their suspicions that the other races who had told them of us might have been driven more by fear than any real facts. They had not adopted the blatant racism of the rest of the sapien species, and they had distanced themselves from the majority of the galactic community, not nearly as much as was the case for us since the others were willing to deal with them albeit with a measure of distaste for their alliance with us, enough that they had to fight for concessions they might have gotten without effort before. Though we were largely insulated from the hatred of the rest of the universe by our alliance with the humans, we still needed to interact with them because although we were the premier shipbuilders, there were other things like medical techniques and internet service that required outside assistance. Humanity was still well behind the curve as far as technology went, so as much as they wanted to help, oft times they couldn't simply because they lacked the knowledge to build the tools, to build the tools to make what we needed. Still, the relative tech advantage was closing rather quickly with our modest assistance. One thing that I didn't expect to come of the situation, nor did any of us really, was the advances in environmental protection. It seems that humans are, first and foremost, curious. They want to know how, why, and what. They see something strange and the first thing they do is poke at it. In this case, it would refer to us. They had never imagined that anything like us existed, not outside of fiction anyway. But studying us was difficult, to say the least, given that they would simultaneously suffocate and fry if they ever took off their suits, so they put a substantial amount of effort and money into developing environmental suits that were less cumbersome while still being able to take the relatively high temperatures and pressures that we required. 
in less than 20 years, or 10-ish years for you humans. They had gone from suits that looked like the ones that they first took to the moon to something that was about as cumbersome as a thick jacket. How do I know what they're like? Well, it turns out that, with a few tweaks, these suits of theirs are as good at keeping heat and air in as out. I'll tell you, once you get past the fact that it's cold enough to literally freeze you solid in less than a minute, Earth's got some pretty amazing stuff. They've got this animal that looks for all the world like someone stuck shards of a rainbow together and animated it. Some of them even gathering huge swarms to migrate. I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time of year to see the trees absolutely covered in them. The tour guide said that the branches have been known to break under their collective weight, which seems impossible since they couldn't be more than a gram or two apiece. Of course, this opened up all kinds of tourism opportunities. Another thing about humans is that they seem to relish the chance to spend their earnings on trinkets and knickknacks. When I asked Lee about it, the ambassador whose name I forgot to ask when we first met, she just laughed and said that humans don't build hordes like dragons do. I would have stuck my tongue out at her if it wouldn't have meant slobbering on my faceplate. Curiously enough, that carries the same meaning for us as it does for humans. Life isn't always smooth sailing though, and it would seem that the universe decided to throw a couple of storms our way. Humans were still making the occasional effort to find cheaper ways to build star drives. While unsuccessful, the latest project did produce some novel ideas and increased the drive's efficiency by 10% and speed by 7%. I swear, telling them something is impossible just makes them whack the problem until a benefit pops out. As far as anyone can tell, our engineers were chatting with a couple of human engineers when the conversation veered into cost analysis and the humans dropped a bomb. It turns out that the cost of producing a drive in an atmosphere like Earth's isn't 10 times what it costs us, as we had been told by the other species. It was 4 times more expensive, and only 3 times as much if you had a handy supply of ore, such as an asteroid belt rich in rare earth elements. For the last 1400 years, we had practically been giving away star drives. Let me tell you, if there was ever anything that could send the Senate into an uproar, it was the fact that we had been undercharging by 60% on our main source of revenue. Humanity wasn't very happy when they found out either, though their anger was pretty evenly split between the injustice of the situation and the fact that they would have to pay more for their drives. Yes, as soon as they found out they agreed, somewhat grudgingly, to pay the proper price for their drives from then on. It was a small comfort, but one that we would remember. Once the whole mess was sorted out, as a gesture of goodwill, the Senate decided to only charge them 70% of the full price. I guess the people in charge wanted to make sure that we stayed on our only allies' good side. Of course, the fact that such technological jumps had been made only spurred humanity to continue their research. It was fascinating to see how they seemed to swarm out of the woodwork, to work on the newest industry. With the ability to visit each other's laboratories, thanks to the new environment suits, our joint research really began to take off. Pun entirely intended, thank you very much. We never had the advantage of having someone who literally saw the world differently to look over our notes, and I have to say they filled in and expanded on some things we never thought of. Then we'd look over their notes and do the same thing. It's truly amazing how many iterations it takes before both parties run out of ideas. In the two decades, we had been in serious collaboration. There were no fewer than five major advances in drive technology, two in weaponry, six in neuroscience, two applied to humans and four to us, and eight fucking teen in medical science. Please pardon my vulgarity, but the emphasis is entirely necessary. Among them a true anti-aging technology that extended our lives by over 40%. I wondered at the time if this is what the start of a golden age felt like. I don't think an alliance like ours has ever happened before. Most species keep to themselves and definitely never let another race into their labs, but humans had a habit of ignoring the ways things were done, and we, well, we were just happy to have the company. 
We expected some backlash when we raised our prices, but the shitstorm it kicked up was unbelievable. The Marets were on the verge of declaring war against us, and Thuk and Rinmaru weren't far behind. Apparently, we were supposed to sit there and take it up the ass like good little wage slaves. Please. We may be adverse to fighting, but we're not going to put up with being cheated at every turn. A couple hotheads wanted to feed them a few nukes and see how they liked it, but thankfully common sense prevailed. We informed them that we had made significant improvements to the drive design, and unless they backed off, they could kiss any chance of getting these new drives goodbye. That put a stop to the noise. Of course, some of the aforementioned hotheads did get one thing. The Senate decided to go with their suggestion of keeping the most improved models local, and selling ones with half the efficiency and speed increases. Five and three and a half percent is a significant improvement over the old model, but it was comforting to know that we had a small but significant hidden advantage should we ever need it. I sincerely hope we never will. It had been nearly 40 years since we first came into contact with the humans. Terran years, that is. 50 Venusian years since we had started counting Venusian years. Of course, Keeping them local meant the humans got the fully improved drives too. Our alliance with them was as strong as ever, and the fact that the new drives had such significant gains over the old model soothed their aching wallets a bit, though there was a lot of grumbling that the price of the upgrades was way too steep. I was young enough to get the prolonged anti-aging treatment, so I was going to be around for a good while. Even without it though, I would have been around to see the universe slowly change around us. Gradually, the two of us caught up to the Riwanu, who were generally considered the most technologically advanced society among the space-faring races. It was strange that, in less than half of a lifetime, we had gone from a race of pariahs to a valued ally. I can barely remember the time when I was a lowly communications tech, talking through text-only channels about starship repairs to people who would prefer I didn't exist. Life goes on, I guess. Then it happened the ultimate development in Star Drives. For as long as there has been FTL, there has been a limit. What it's called varies, but everyone knows that if a starship emerges from FTL too close to a planet, that planet gets fried if it's lucky, and torn apart if it's not. That limit is why terraforming is so expensive. Getting anywhere in sublight takes forever, and hauling a giant cargo of atmosphere makes it even slower since sublight energy requirements and top speed are mass dependent and compressed air isn't much lighter than its equivalent in water. So in order to terraform a planet, the method is as follows. 1. Emerge from FTO a good distance from your atmosphere source planet, usually a gas giant. 2. Spend a couple weeks travelling to said planet at sublight speed. 3. Filter out the gases you want and compress them into tanks takes another few weeks to fill up the hold. 4. Spend two or three months getting far away enough to not blow the gas giant up. 5. Enter FTL. 6. Spend another short eternity hauling the harvested atmosphere to the rock you want to live on. 7. Repeat several hundred times with several dozen ships. But now? Now there was no limit. Not for us, anyway. These new drives allowed a ship to exit FTL practically on top of a planet. Even if you skim the atmosphere on the exit, it would be fine, as the hapless pilot discovered when he made a mistake when entering his coordinates. Due to shock, most likely. Not that I blame him. When I first heard the results of the Alpha test, my legs collapsed under me. Now, instead of spending decades and billions or trillions of dollars hauling air and water to make a planet livable, or finding one that already had an atmosphere and hydrosphere, which is easier said than done, which doesn't even touch on the time of money needed to seize the planet with flora and fauna. Now it was possible to have a planet ready for the first stages of seeding in less than 10 Venusian years, or 6 Terran years. Not to mention that even ordinary shipping and interstellar travel time would be only a fraction as long. I left that meeting with my head spinning. The possibilities were almost limitless. We could dominate all shipping and travel, as well as being able to create paradises from deserts almost in the blink of an eye. 
the potential was absolutely staggering, and I had no idea what was going to happen when word got out. These developments were light years beyond anything any other species had at its disposal. I went to get myself a strong drink. In the end, we decided to treat these new drives as a trade secret and not sell them to anyone, at least until someone else developed them independently. They were a huge advantage, and also, well, I won't deny that there was a certain amount of vindictive delight in being in the position to get a little back from those who cheated us for over a millennium. We mostly avoided the temptation to make them pay through the nose, though we might have added on a few unnecessary surcharges for speeches that had been particularly unpleasant to us in the past. The humans were mumbling about the incalculable military advantages, but we put our foot down. Conquering a well-entrenched race while their friends are trying to beat you to a pulp is a losing proposition, no matter how many bells and whistles you attach to their ships. On the other hand, if you can offer them something they truly want, you can get all the benefits of having a vassal with none of the problems. Planets with breathable atmosphere and water are exponentially rarer than barren rocks, and if someone could turn those barren rocks into habitable worlds in a fraction of the time it took any other race, the prices such a service could command are very nearly infinite. And that wasn't even touching on what it would mean for interstellar travel and shipping. The possibilities were intoxicating to consider. Our fellow sapien races were quite thoroughly screwed, much to our poorly hidden delight. They could either terraform their planets the traditional way and wait 20 to 50 years, plus the same again for seeding flora and fauna, or they could pay us half the cost and get a livable planet in half the time, even with the time seeding the planet with life. Anyone who had two brain cells to rub together came to us, no matter how little they liked us. We had the rest of the universe by the balls and it felt so good especially for old-timers like me, who remembered a time when we weren't friends with anyone because everyone only saw us as freaks of nature, and only our usefulness as a race duped into paid slavery kept them from killing us all out of sheer reactionary disgust. I took another healthy gulp of my drink, hoping the pins and needles would distract me from the dark turn my thoughts had taken. When had I turned into a reminiscing old geezer? But then... Doesn't everyone turn into a reminiscing old geezer eventually? I finish my drink and pay my tab. It was going to be another long day tomorrow. The Temir had approached the newly formed Terraforming Requisition Board about a contract for the terraforming of no fewer than ten planets, and given their relatively extreme politeness towards us in the past, and the fact that they are desperately overcrowded and poor to boot, we might just give them a break. I have the say, the rest of my life looked like it was going to be fun.